Sims Garden really is a little gem in Homewood. Um, we'll go through where it is and what it is and how it came into being. There really isn't anything else like it anywhere else as far as I'm aware. Um, although I think I've heard of one place called Wingate, I believe, in Charlotte, but I'm not sure if that's Charlotte, North Carolina or, or wherever that is. <laughs> um, but apparently Miss Sims did know about that and June Mays, who was also a friend of Miss Sims, knew about that place. And it, it was similar in that it was left um, to Charlotte in a will, but it was it was left with some money as well. Unfortunately, Sims Gardens wasn't left with any money. We'll talk a little bit about the struggles um, of making it a public botanical garden without any money. <laughs> um, but it really is a unique little place. It's not a park. Um, it's not a botanical garden in the sense that like the Birmingham Botanical Garden or Aldridge Gardens is. Those have different administrative and management structures and they're obviously really big. Um, this is just a small little, what I like to call pocket garden in the heart of Homewood in the Edgewood neighborhood. So let's go to, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, so you should be seeing a map now of where Sims Garden is located as indicated by a little red arrow. We are east of I-65 and west of Highway 31, right in the Edgewood neighborhood. Just to zoom in a little bit more, you can see we're situated really in a heavily um, residential area between Irving and Highland Roads, just a couple of blocks behind the Homewood Middle School on one side and a couple of blocks behind the Edgewood Strip with you know Taco Mama, Saul's Barbecue, Sam's Deli, um, just behind those areas as well. Just to give you an idea of the size, we are five residential lots. Each of these lots are based on 1920s lot plans. So they're 50 feet wide, 100 feet long. So that's it. That's really all the space that we have. And, you know, I'm sure Ms. Sims at one point wanted this area to grow and for the city to add more land or maybe for some other benefactors to leave property to add to the garden. But Unfortunately, that just really hasn't happened. Um, if, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, on the northwest side of the property, actually just west on Irving Road, those two big houses there were just built within the last four years where there had been one small cottage before. Now it's replaced with about 95% impervious surface on the north side uphill from the garden, which is caused a few issues with stormwater runoff. The area immediately to the east of the garden on the Highland side um, has recently been redeveloped. Those two lots now have two big houses on them. And the area between the garden and Mecca Avenue, those five lots, now have five houses on them. So <laughs> we are really landlocked here in the middle of this neighborhood. Um, so we, that's all the area we have to work with, but we're certainly making the most of it and trying to, to keep Ms. Sims' wishes and vision of a botanical garden alive. We really cannot talk about Sims Gardens without talking about Catherine Sims herself. Unfortunately, we don't really know, at least I haven't been able to uncover um, in the last two years, a whole lot of information about her life before she moved to Homewood. Um, we know that her beau died in World War II. Um, both of her brothers served in World War II and died before her. One of her brothers, Ben Sims, who you can see in the obituary on the left side of the screen. I'm not sure, it might be on the right side of your screen if the images are reversed, but in that in memoriam obituary, um, her brother Ben Sims just died a few months before she did in 2006. Um, her older brother died a few years before. Um, we don't, I don't even know where she was born, <laughs> but we know a whole lot about her life from when she moved to Homewood. Uh, the house that, the Sims house that is here on her property now, um, was built in 1927, but her and her mother moved here around 1960 and lived here 
until they both passed away and until she passed away in 2006. There was a brief period that she was in a nursing home before she passed away, but for about 40 good years, she was here at 908 Highland Road in what is now Sims Gardens. Um, she and her brother, and I presume her other older brother, were hugely involved in their communities. They were all lovers of art and music and literature and gardening. Um, her brother Ben, actually, as you could read, was the patron of the Memorial Garden at the Atlanta History Center. And he commissioned several paintings from an Italian-American artist, Athos Minaboni, Minaboni who painted birds. Um, in fact, she had some of the art um, after her brother passed away. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that here anymore, but um, I do have a book that's signed by Miss Sims that is a collection of Minaboni's paintings, which is really sweet. A neighbor who she had given the book to returned it so that we could have it here um, is sort of a museum piece, and I, I love showing that to people. There's a whole ton of books here, too, that um, she left a whole collection of Alexander Hamilton um, essays and books and a whole bunch of just really neat things. She left about 55 boxes of books to the Birmingham Southern College Library, as well as an endowment scholarship. Um, she also set up a Catherine Sims advised fund at the Community Foundation of Greater Birmingham, which is just used for um, any charitable giving. There's an advisor to that fund who basically gets to choose where to make donations. Um, she was really involved in politics in Homewood. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm sure some of you know Lynn and Brian Luciano. Brian Luciano was on the council for several years and she was the reason why he served on the council. Uh, she got him to run and supported his campaign. Uh, she also got J.J. Bischoff to run, who's the current chief of staff for the city of Homewood. And he told me a funny story the other day about um, when, before he was ready to run, she was really trying to get him to run for council, but he had the flu and he was really sick. And it was the day of the last day to register. And she called him and said, JJ, I'm gonna send an ambulance to your house and pick you up and take you there to register and I will bankroll your campaign. <laughs> that is the kind of lady that she was. You know, she was just really civically engaged and charitable and involved in so many things. But she still, she also was involved in dental research at UAB. In fact, that's where she retired from. So I don't know how she managed to, to get involved in all of these things as, as much as she did. But she did, and at the same time, she managed to garden. I mean, gardening was a love instilled in her from her mother, I'm told. Um, her mother apparently told her that half the fun of growing flowers and plants is found in giving them away. And that certainly was her motto throughout her life. She what became known as the plant lady of Homewood because she was always giving away cuttings or seeds. And if you followed her directions, she guaranteed they would grow. But you would almost have to have the whole dig dug sometimes before she would part with anything. So she really did live up to this name of the plant lady. And she uh, was also nominated to be the Homewood citizen for 2002 to 2003. Uh, because of all the different things that she was involved in, especially in that case for her support of the Homewood Library, the Homewood Citizens Association, and the, and the local Humane Society. Um, and when asked, you know, what she thought about that, about that recognition, she said, it's wonderful. I've got them all full, don't I? <laughs> so really just a remarkable lady. Um, she decided as early as 2002, that she was going to give her property to the city of Homewood, that she was going to leave that at the house and the, the, the garden to the city in her will. Um, she was quoted as saying that in the 2002 article when she was nominated to be the citizen of the year. Um, so this was something she really planned on for many years. And in fact, in talking with June Mays, again, a friend of hers who was a garden designer, and, and did some designs uh, of various places, but also after Miss Sims' death, she did some designs for Miss Sims' gardens too. But she had told me that in talking with Catherine before she passed away, um, I don't know how close to her death this was, but she knew of Catherine's wishes to create this 
botanical park out of her property and she told her you know Catherine you really need to leave some funds <laughs> for the city to do this and they talked about Wingate and how Wingate had a million dollars but Catherine said nope they're just going to get the property and the house and that's it she wasn't going to leave them any money she had really planned out you know where she wanted her money to go and her other effects and the city was just going to get the property and she thought that they could do something with that so that's how it came to be. In 2006, she passed away, but it took several years before the formalities of passing, handing the property over to the city could happen. Um, and it was in 2009, actually December 2009, so right at the end of the year, when the city finally did get to sign the conveyance over to them from the executor of the will. It, part of the reason it took so long was because since she didn't have any known surviving relatives, there was a process that they had to go through to, to find um, any remaining cousins or relatives that might still, you know, be around or have some sort of claim. She apparently had 13 cousins, but they were scattered from California to Florida. So <laughs> it took a little doing, getting in touch with them all. Some of them had already passed away um, and the ones that were surviving had to sign waivers. So it took some doing. And you can imagine in those years from 2006 to 2009, people knowing who she was and knowing her property, uh, there was a bit of plant, you know, maybe we'll, we'll just call it um, plant rescue. <laughs> people came to the garden, dig up, dug up things that she had had here, um, you know, for fear of the fact that we didn't know if it was gonna get developed or what was gonna happen. Um, she had also told people, you know, to come get plants. So when she passed away, some of those people she had told to come get plants finally took her up on it. Um, and a lot of it got overgrown. Obviously, it wasn't being cared for. Um, so it kind of became a public nuisance after a while, too. Um, so the city came in at some point when the property had just gotten too overgrown um, and mowed it and bloat it, you know, just kind of knocked everything back. Well, naturally, that upset a lot of other people, too, who felt that the city just hadn't um, done the right thing, that they had destroyed some things. And so one of the council members at the time decided to figure out a way to, to manage it. There was no landscape department anymore. The landscape department dissolved in 2010. So the city was really struggling to figure out how are they going to make this property a botanical park, as it said in the will. Um, so in 2011, the Southern Environmental Center wrote a proposal that said that they would take over the property. So ever since 2011, the Southern Environmental Center, Birmingham Southern College, has been the managing agency for the garden. Um, so that is how it all came to be. <laughs> this picture that you're looking at now is what the house looked like in 1959, around the time that Miss Sims would have purchased it with her mother. This is from a tax assessor's report. Um, so the one thing I really want to point out here, obviously, you know, it's a nice typical example of a 1920s house. We see these all over Homewood, obviously a lot less of them now with the teardowns and rebuilds. Um, but the porch is a really unique feature on this house. And it's the one thing that has changed. Everything else on the house itself is stayed the same. But at some point, as you'll see in the next pictures, Miss Sims enclosed that porch and extended that bedroom out. So we've lost this nice porch. But I'm hoping that with some historical um, recognition, which I'm working on now, that we'll be able to get some funds to restore that porch to the way it was originally. Um, so the next thing is obviously looking at the landscape around the house. You get the typical foundation plantings with the lawn surrounding the house and some nice trees. Well, this picture is what it looked like in 2012. So this is a few months to a year after the Southern Environmental Center started managing it. And this is one of the first big volunteer efforts to come in and start cleaning it out by hand, you know, rather than just running over it with a big bush hog. Um, you can see the volunteers are working to try to get in there and clean it up by hand. There were lots of these volunteer efforts. 
Now, when Roald Hazelhoff is in the center of the picture standing by the, the handrail there, he's the director of the uh, Southern Environmental Center, and he also knew Ms. Sims. So when he wrote the proposal to take control of the property, it came with a one-time $140,000 grant from the Catherine Sims Fund. The advisor to the fund felt like she was going to have to do something, put some money there in order to make this property become what Catherine had hoped it would be. Because as you can see, now she had passed away in 2006. This is 2011 when the agreement was signed. So it was really looking bad in those years. It had really gotten overgrown and things had been dug up and moved. So she really felt that, you know, it was the, the right thing to do to give that one time donation. And so this is them cleaning it up in 2011. And then this is how it looks now. <clears throat> so obviously this is in the fall. This is actually the fall of last year. So things have really grown up <laughs> in a good way. These are plantings um, that people came in and did with some of that money that Roald had from the advised fund. They hired some landscaping companies. They came in and planted some things. Um, we have a list of an inventory, really, of the plants that were in Miss Sims Gardens in 1996. So we feel like that was probably at the peak of her gardening days. You know, the garden had been in development for many, many years by that time. So that was a good comprehensive list. So that's the list that we've all been working with from 2011 to now to try to bring back some of those plants that were in her garden. So you're seeing a lot of those plantings represented here. Okay, so we're gonna just go through a quick photo album of some of the plants that are currently in the garden. This is not gonna be a, <coughs> this is not gonna be a comprehensive, um, show or display of every single plant that's in the garden now or that has been in the garden, but just to kind of give you an idea of what we've been able to, to bring back to the garden and nurture. Some of these things, like the uh, lilies that you saw there, had just come back on their own. They haven't had to be replanted, but with the work that has been done in the garden, some of these things have just sprung up. A lot of these are natives, but many of them are not native plants. Um, there were some invasive plants in the garden too. The trumpet vine or the cowage vine is one that I struggle with. <laughs> Having to clean that one out every year, it just keeps coming back. Um, but then there's a lot of really interesting medicinal plants. Um, of course, there is edibles in the garden as well. And um, that's a big part of having the botanical garden and bringing her vision to life is having not only just things that you can look at, but things that you can interact with. She was really big into teaching children. Um, obviously she loved her trees. Um, <clears throat> but some of these old heritage plants like the paradise apple and the peaches are, are things that we also believe are important to have in the garden. We do have bees. Uh, the bees are taken care of by a neighbor, Cliff Spencer. Um, so we get to have them in the garden and they certainly enjoy being in the garden and I certainly enjoy their honey. <laughs> I think this is something that Miss Sims would have been excited about. The kitchen garden that you see um, is a master gardener project that I helped install last year. So this is sort of your victory garden, if you will, which has come in real handy this year. The children really love pulling up carrots or picking tomatoes. And that's really what it's for, is just anybody to come along and harvest it. Um, one of my neighbors actually had a great idea to put up a little sign that says Little Free Garden, like the Little Free Libraries around town. So we've started doing this, taking this Little Free Library concept and turning it into Little Free Gardens. So anybody can come along and take whatever produce they want. It's kind of fun, whether it be flowers or edibles. So that's just a quick overview of what's in the garden now. So let's talk about the management structure. So I mentioned that the Environmental Center in Birmingham Southern have a memorandum of agreement with the city of Homewood. That's been in place since 2011. Uh, when I 
came on board a couple of years ago. I applied through the Southern Environmental Center and was appointed by the Southern Environmental Center. <clears throat> but I had also asked the city to appoint an advisory committee, so a formal sort of advisory board for the garden um, to help with decision making. Look at the sunset um, there. there. Sorry, was that a question or? No, okay. Um, so the Southern Environmental Center manages 13 different ecoscapes as well as Turkey Creek Nature Preserve, as well as a magic school bus program and lots of other programs that they're <clears throat> fundraising for and running all the time. So Sims Garden can kind of get resetting over there. Sort of lost in the mix of all of that. So I wanted to make sure that the city of Homewood and that the Southern Environmental Center weren't kind of forgetting about Sims Gardens. So when I came on board, I had the city set up an advisory board that was specifically there to help make sure that things were progressing here and help make decisions and help advocate um, on behalf of the gardens to the city. So this is a city appointed advisory board. But this is essentially how the structure is set up. Now, the city of Homewood has the deed to the property. So they administer it really their top level and then the Southern Environmental Center and I manage the programs, events, fundraising, and the actual boots on the ground work. Since 2011 there have been six caretakers including myself and so you can see Laura Rogers in the top left is with Roald Hazelhoff and um, the council woman whose name is escaping me right now, who was instrumental in getting the relationship together between the Southern Environmental Center and the city of Homewood. And the top middle is Arnold Rutkus. <clears throat> he was actually the landscape architect uh, and uh, he had a landscaping company who did the first big um, push to kind of make the garden more user friendly. <laughs> and then he became a caretaker a couple of years later. <clears throat> and then there was a series of, of other caretakers between 2015 and 2018 when I came on board. So it was kind of a revolving door for a little while, <clears throat> but hopefully I'll be here to stay for a good long while. So as I said, when I came on board, um, I asked the city to set up an advisory board, but that wasn't the only thing. Um, when I applied, I went to Britt Thames, who's standing next to me, and Andy Gwaltney, who's on the far other end of the group, standing next to JJ Bischoff. Um, I think you'll see another familiar face in that picture. <laughs> um, I asked Britt and Andy, because they're the ward representatives for Ward 1 in Homewood on the council. I told them that I was applying, you know, asked them sort of what the situation was with the city and Sims Gardens and their feelings about it. And I got them and JJ and Henry and the gentleman in the middle is Greg Cobb, he's the city engineer. <clears throat> and then also the mayor and the Parks and Rec um, director who aren't in this picture. To kind of just come out to the property, walk it over, because it had been years for many of them <laughs> to actually set foot on the property. Just look at it inside and out. Make sure that this is something that they really wanted to continue promoting. Because in Miss M's will, she does say if the city decided they didn't want to continue or couldn't manage the property as a botanical park, <clears throat> that the property would become a real estate gift to the Community Foundation of Greater Birmingham. The Community Foundation of Greater Birmingham will only accept such gifts if they can make a quick sell out of them and then the money would go into the Catherine Sims Advised Fund. <clears throat> so obviously, that's not an ideal situation for anyone. We don't really need five more houses on this small little street um, or block here in Edgewood. And the community are really supportive of it. So everybody decided that yes, you know, this was something that we really wanted to support. So I asked the city to make sure to put a line in the budget for Sims Gardens, <clears throat> even though they weren't required to by the memorandum of agreement with the Southern Environmental Center. But I asked them to do that because we needed to have some, some funds from the city itself. It needed to be a part of the annual budget if the city really wanted to see this become a treasure, you know, something that's used by the community and something that could become sustainable itself at some point. It was gonna need their support both administratively and 
financially. I asked them to appoint that advisory committee. And then we started engaging in a master plan process, which had not been done before. Um, that master plan included a new landscape design that would address stormwater issues, um, accessibility issues. So right now we're not ADA compliant, so we can't really charge for events because um, nobody's going to have a wedding or a birthday party if, you know, a grandma or an aunt or uncle or mom or dad can't walk onto the property. Um, it is addressing sustainability and fundraising. And as the first full-time resident manager of the property with the city support and a, sort of a new, turning a new leaf over, um, we have some good accountability here for the first time, I feel like, um, since the property really has been taken over by the city. Okay, so similar to the overview I gave you of the botanical treasures that are in the garden, I wanna give you a quick overview of some of the events that we have already done in the last two years <clears throat> to kind of give you an idea of how useful the space can be to the community. So we have done quite a few events, um, starting with all kinds of youth engagement, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Uh, we've done some family events, jazz and coffee in the gardens, movie nights are probably my favorite so far. Um, we've had a wedding, we've had several tea parties, we did a Mother's Day tea party. Uh, another birthday party idea was the fairy tea garden party, pirate treasure hunt parties, um, and then scavenger hunts uh, around holidays. Obviously, I love to decorate um, the garden for Halloween and for Christmas. I think I'm probably the first caretaker that's done that, but I think that's a really important part of <clears throat> this space is for all seasons to offer something to the community. Um, so those are just, that's a quick rundown of some of the events that we've done and can continue to do and build on in the future. One of the things that I am talking um, about doing now is, and this is just very preliminary, but I've started discussions with the Alabama Shakespeare um, Festival. And they're concerned that they're losing membership and that they're not able to sustain themselves especially in the time of covid because a lot of their members are in the older age groups and they're just not getting families and young people engaged uh, but when i lived in cambridge england for five years one of the things i looked forward to every summer the most was the shakespeare festival because they would do the shakespeare in the gardens of all the different college gardens around cambridge so we've started talking about doing Shakespeare in the garden at Sims, and that's going to be at least a year, if not two years out, because first we need to get accessible and get our landscaping done. But that is something that I'm really, really excited about, and I think is going to be a wonderful event to do here every, well, hopefully spring and maybe fall, <laughs> because summer in the garden is a little bit brutal in Alabama. <clears throat> so. I've been talking about our landscape plan, so let's just go over that a little bit. The current plan is the current layout of the garden. This is what you see now if you come to the garden, and it represents just sort of um, different initiatives, different caretakers have had different approaches over the years. Um, there was a group of neighbors that formed together and called themselves the Friends of Sims that volunteered to help the caretakers um, with <clears throat> cleaning up the garden, landscaping, and a little bit of fundraising here and there. I've found at least three different plans from 2011 to 2018 that were drawn for the garden, and I can see where bits of them have been implemented but never, not one of them has been implemented in its entirety. So there was just a lot of sort of stopping and starting because there wasn't really a big master plan. So it's, what we have now is kind of a spaghetti network of pathways that are covered in gravel and then a few interesting botanical features around the garden. What we'd like to have is much more green space, uh, a lot fewer paths and then a main accessible path 
So this accessible path is mainly for wheelchairs and strollers and walking. Um, and it's very strict as far as what types of materials we can use, but we're, we're going with brick. Um, and then it will be bordered by grass on the outside and also in the middle. And then the areas that are completely in shade will have a, another ground cover that will grow in the shade. So we really want that path to be a lot more green than it appears in this proposed rendering, but we do need to have that accessible path. And then we're gonna have a pavilion slash greenhouse and a lawn. So currently we have a big parking lot, which really doesn't get used. Most of our visitors are neighbors that are cycling or walking to the garden. And anytime that we have had a big event, there are three parking lots around the garden. There's the middle school parking lot, there's the parking lot at Edgewood and the parking lot at the Presbyterian Church, just one street over. So we really don't need a huge parking lot here. What we need is more green space. So we're converting our parking lot into a lawn so that we can move our movies on the lawn, uh, movies in the garden to the lawn area and have more attendees for that event. We're expanding our event space, our little courtyard behind the house so that we can have, you know, bigger weddings. When we do cocktails in the garden and jazz in the garden, so we can invite, you know, fit more people into that space. Um, obviously, everybody's thinking a lot about space now in, in the time of COVID. You want to make sure you have lots of space for everybody to spread out. So this is sort of what we're going towards. Um, the really interesting thing about this plan as well is there's a lot of stormwater retention here. Um, you can't really tell unless you know what you're looking for, um, and I can't really zoom in, but there is a lot of areas that are bioswells or bioretention so that when we do get a big rain event, we're not just flushing it all out to the street. We want to retain as much of that as possible on the property, but where we do get lots of rain like we had this winter and those bioretention areas overflow, there is gonna be a drain underneath that accessible path, like a French drain that you won't be able to see when you're walking on it, but that the overflow from the retention will connect to that drain and it will then get daylighted out to the street. Uh, but we're really, really trying to be as innovative as possible with the stormwater design, with the accessibility design, so that when you come here, you just really feel like you're in a green space and you don't really notice the infrastructure of it. Um, we're gonna have rainwater cisterns. Hopefully we'll get some solar in the areas that we can have solar. <clears throat> so we really want this to be just a showpiece as well for what neighbors could implement into their own yards. Okay. All right, so in order to raise money to get this plan in place, we are starting a series of fundraisers as well as a capital fundraising campaign, but our first fundraiser is going to be the pumpkin and mum sale starting September 12th. Here at the garden, we're just going to turn the garden into a big pumpkin patch. <clears throat> we'll have a scarecrow trail. We'll have treats and tricks and all kinds of just fun interactive activities in a safe outdoor socially distant setting. You can pre order pumpkins and mums and then pick them up here. Um, we're really excited about this. This is the first time that anyone's ever tried this here. <clears throat> and we just thought it would be a really good idea because there really isn't anywhere that you can go to select a pumpkin in a nice sort of farm style, garden style environment um, in Homewood. You pretty much have to drive 40 minutes to an hour outside of town if you want to go to like a farm to pick out a pumpkin. So we're really hoping that this will do well and that this is something that we can repeat every year. And that just about does it. I'll just leave you with this quote um, that was in Miss Sims' obituary. And if you want to have ask any questions, if you've raised your hand, hopefully Henry can ask me your questions. <clears throat> Amy, this is Henry. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, could you um, tell us a little bit, bit about yourself, um, how you came to be at the gardens and, and what your plans are personally? Sure. So um, I moved to Homewood in 2013. I'm from Cambridge, England. I'm originally from Mobile, Alabama, where I was born and raised. And my background is in biogeography. I went to the University of South Alabama and that wasn't the degree that I was wanting, but 
I guess I should say it wasn't the degree I, I realized I was wanting. <laughs> I knew I wanted to be in environmental science. I was, you know, the outdoor naturalist child. I would skip school to go fishing and stay in the woods all day. Um, so biodiversity conservation was really what I wanted to do, but I didn't know what that was called at the time. Um, and the University of South Alabama didn't really have a lot of options. <laughs> so I ended up majoring in geography and minoring in biology. Um, and then uh, I got really engaged in the sort of technical side of geography, geographic information systems, remote sensing. So I ended up going to Cambridge to do my master's in GIS and remote sensing, where I used those tools for biodiversity conservation. So I ended up working in the United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge, where I managed something called the World Database on Protected Areas. Um, along the way, I always had gardens. I worked at Bellingrath Gardens in Mobile for a good long time. Um, I had a garden allotment in Cambridge next to a pub where I would grow um, beets and corn and potatoes and tomatoes and things that I would give to the pub in exchange for beer. <laughs> so <laughs> that, was a, that was a great little relationship. Um, and they were able to put on their menu that it was locally sourced, you know. So um, we had chickens in England. You know, it's just been being outdoorsy and having my hands in the soil is just really something that's always been kind of a part of me. Um, always been a great lover of trees and just being outdoors in general. So yeah, I, I feel like my approach to um, life is just this really holistic view of, you know, how everything kind of works together. So at one point, um, my job title was spatial ecologist. Um, you know, I've, I've sort of done a lot of different things, but gardening has sort of been a theme um, throughout my years. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> I came to Homewood because I had family here. Um, but we left England because my husband had been putting off his uh, higher education goals the whole time that we were in Cambridge. He's a nurse and he wanted to be a nurse anesthetist. So we moved to Birmingham so that he could get into UAB or Stanford. Um, ironically, he didn't get into either. He got into a school in Florida. <laughs> so when he got accepted to Florida Gulf Coast University, I was looking for a full-time job. I had been teaching at Samford and I had been doing some consulting work as a geographic information system specialist, but I was looking for something full-time because he was obviously leaving his job and going to be a student full-time. And then this came up and the person who had been the caretaker before me, um, Rachel, had asked me if I knew anyone who was interested and I thought, well, maybe this Maybe this is a good thing for the garden and for me at this time, and it worked out. So here I am. Thanks, Amy. We're really fortunate to have you. And um, if anybody uh, does know, uh, Amy is one of our newer members, uh, our, our board members for Friends of Shades Creek, along with uh, Amber Custos, who's on the meeting tonight. So uh, they bring a, a nice younger vibe to the organization. So we're very, very pleased to have them and fortunate to have you, Amy. And thanks for kicking off our 23rd year, yeah. beginning of our, our 23rd year um, this year. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yes, thank, thank you, Amy. I'm just so impressed with what you've done with the garden so far. And um, you're... Um, enthusiasm for it and uh, your vision and work uh, it really shines through what you're doing and the plans that you have for the garden so uh, I hope you'll be there for a long long time thank you me too and I plan to come get a pumpkin and maybe some mums too for my for my garden um, I'm glad you talked wonderful yes absolutely Anybody else have questions? If you, uh, I have a question. You can unmute and just ask, go ahead and ask. A Amy? Yes. When are the hours people can come wander through the property? 
I really don't keep hours at the garden. It said on the Facebook page when I was the caretaker, I noticed that it said the hours were from eight to five, but we don't have hours posted here. There's no gates. So I, I have solar lights lining the path at night for people who, you know, want to walk in the evening. The, there really isn't um, an do hour. Need, do you need to be notified before we come or just show up? No, you're, you just walk up anytime you want to. Well, great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, Jim. <laughs> I've wondered too when you can come. How, um, how will you advertise more the pumpkin mum thing? So I just sent um, that graphic that I showed you to the Homewood Star. So that'll be in the October issue, um, okay. which comes out at the end of September. I'm also reaching out to the Mountain Brook Journal. The Portico doesn't exist anymore, so I need to reach out to Homewood Life. But We'll be printing some postcards and sending those home with kids at school and, and just getting them out into business windows. I've got some flyers too that I'll be putting around town. And then obviously I'll set up a Facebook event and promote it that way. But any suggestions for how to get the word out is yeah. well. Will, will you send that flyer to Michelle or would, could you send it to us? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, if you send it to us, Amy, I will make sure it gets advertised uh, with one of our e-messages and, uh, and on Facebook also. I'm sure Amber can help us with Facebook. Absolutely. I think I can go ahead and pop it in your, that little chat window. Okay. Let's see if you can go ahead and do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. I just put it in the chat window. Okay. Oh, good. Thanks. And I think Chris has a question, maybe. Chris? Yeah. Um, Amy, I love the gardens. And my favorite part of it is the, well, in this hot summer, the part that's under the trees and all the benches. I think they're just wonderful. And I was there the other day, and it was noon, and it was brutally hot. But um, it was so cool in the garden. Maybe because it's high up, it caught some uh, a, a very nice breeze. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That, that is, it's amazing what a lot of trees and a little grass and a little green can do for the climate. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> makes a huge difference. And that's the only way that I can stand to be out there for hours at a time in these dog days of summer is just to get in a shady spot and just work in that shady spot all day. And I have a question. Yeah. Um, obviously the stormwater drainage improvement part is going on now. But, yes. um, and then when do um, the proposed plan, when will parts of that start to go in? Good question and good point. Um, we, yeah, there is some landscaping going on in the garden now. So if you do come by, you'll notice that there, there are some silt fences up in the back area of the garden uh, where we do have some heavy equipment going back and forth. Uh, last year, the city and I and some of the neighbors and Willow Homes, who was developing the houses to the west of the garden, <clears throat> got together to address some of the stormwater issues. And we were initially going to split the cost of it five ways, but then the neighbors on Irving and Highland Road said, well, can we just vacate the alley and we'll take care of that stormwater issue. So, of course, they had to present <clears throat> a landscaping plan to show how they were going to fix it, but they had wanted to do some landscaping in their backyards anyway. And the only way to access that was through that alley that ran through the garden. So the city agreed to let the neighbors vacate the alley. It was just a paper alley. It was an AT&T wire running through it and that's it. So they are now doing all the landscaping in their backyard and re-landscaping what was the alley and putting in some bio swells and some huge new drainage pipes. They're busting out the whole stormwater system in the street and redoing that. I mean it's huge expense 
way more than what we were going to do when we were just going to split it up ways. <clears throat> but they're doing it right. And that's amazing. Um, so I went to the city a couple of weeks ago on Monday and asked the finance committee for some funds to go ahead and start phasing in the part of our landscaping plan that is adjacent to that alley so that we could go ahead and put in our, a few of our stormwater management solutions and the ADA compliant path. And the city said, okay, let's go ahead and get some construction documents done and put it out to bid. So in a you know, couple of months when those bids come back in, we'll be able to select one and then the city will hopefully <laughs> give us all the funding to do that, what we're calling phase one of the landscaping plan. So I would say between October and November, we should start working on our plan. Um, and then in the meantime, I'm going to be applying for grants and we have the pumpkin fundraiser. I've got another fundraiser I'm working on, but isn't official yet. I want to do um, a take home tea party or a take home harvest supper with one of our local restaurants where they're catering it, but you can come to the garden to pick it up, that kind of thing. Um, so we have a couple of little fundraising ideas in mind, but we're going to really be pursuing our capital fundraising campaign over the next few months. We'll be kicking that off. So the whole landscaping plan is about $450,000. <laughs> so <clears throat> we have a, a lot of fundraising to do, but we'll at least be starting on the phase one and ticking two of the really big boxes um, in the next, you know, two to three months. Wonderful. And Amy, I was wondering, uh, can people check out some of the books? that are at the Sims place or is that just to look at while they're there? Yeah, that's not something that I've really figured out yet, like checking the books out. I've actually been wondering what to do with the books. Um, I, I'll bring them outside and show them to people if it comes up in conversation, but the house isn't really open. Obviously I'm living in the house, so the house isn't really open all the time. Um, as you know, uh, we've had meetings here the Edgewood Garden Club will schedule a meeting here I've had book clubs schedule meetings here um, when we do birthday parties and parties and weddings we open up you know the bathrooms and things like that but um, the house itself because it's a residence I don't really people don't really come and go in the house at at their pleasure so, <laughs> so the book yeah. says because they're in the house and they're really really old I haven't really figured out what to do with them yet um, and actually the books were left to the person who's the advisor of the funds. So I need to get with her and figure out if she left them here because she doesn't want them or if she wants to claim them or so. So yeah, I, for now, they're not something that I even have a list of anywhere. Um, but if somebody's interested, I can always show them to them. You, you might want to check with the Botanical Gardens Library and see what they advise. They also have an archivist. Yes, so, it's Jason Kirby, I think. Right. I, yeah, I was I was wanting to reach out to him. I actually did send him an email in 2018 and I just never heard from him. Um, and I talked to him a little bit about it when I was doing the Master Gardener course, um, but we just haven't connected as far as me getting the books to him or him coming out here. Uh, but yeah, I am. I, I would, once I figure out if the trust fund advisor wants the books or doesn't want the books, then I'll know what I can do with them at that point. Okay, any other questions? All right, well. Well, we appreciate you. you so much doing this, Amy, tonight. Uh, you were our first uh, virtual uh, presentation and kicking off the 2021 year uh, programs that we have. And we're going to be giving the next, um, the next program will be in September. It'll be the second Thursday in September. Uh, we'll have Hana, uh, I can't remember her name now. It used to be Burrow. Excuse me, uh, Barris. Barris, yes. And uh, Scott Hoffer will be coming from Jefferson County and Stormwater to talk about what they do and how we can help them with their jobs. And so Michelle is Scott Hofer. Hoffer. Uh, Hofer, okay, thanks, James. 
And then in October, um, let's see, who do we have in October? I can't remember. <laughs> Henry, do you remember? <laughs> um, uh, that will be a surprise. You'll have to wait until I send that out because it's, it's head right now. Is that, is that uh, Ross Bridge? Is that is Ross Bridge? I think Ross November Bridge. is Ross Bridge. Uh, I know at some point Henry and I and Amber were going to do a tree talk on the Greenway, right? Right, and that's going to be in December for, for our Chris, sort of our virtual Christmas party. I'm not sure how that's going to work, but we'll definitely have you talking about trees and what's going on with the Greenway. And Jim, did you want to say something about uh, November and? Yeah. yeah. Bridge. Is, is the Ross Bridge thing November? I need to know. November, okay. yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, you're November. Right. Now, for some reason, I am forgetting what's in October, but um, I have it written down. It's just uh, gone out of my head right now, but you'll find out later. So we have, <laughs> I, we have a full lineup, and it's going to all be virtual this fall. So we hope you'll come back, and we hope uh, you'll tell other people to come join us too. Michelle, I have Jane doing the Shades Creek Greenway Extension Progress in October. That's it, right. yes, of course, yes. Uh, the Greenway, uh, several people have asked me about the Greenway recently and whether it's ever gonna be extended. I've heard several people ask me this question. So that's what the program is gonna be about is Jane talking about the extension and it is coming. Um, it's just not gonna come quite as quickly as people want it to come, but it is coming. So she'll tell you the details about that. That's in October. So I will send this out as a, as a message at one point and you can tell your friends and other members what's coming up for our virtual meeting. So anything else but we we appreciate you doing the program tonight amy it was wonderful you did a great job and we're learning a lot about showing slides on here did everyone think it uh, did it work okay on everyone's computer everyone have yes. okay yeah it worked very well it did oh what was that Oh, I, I unmuted myself for a minute. I was going to say it worked. It worked well on mobile. I'm on my phone, so worked great. Good, good. Yeah, see, James has got uh, the thumbs up, so that's, <laughs> I, need to, I need to learn that, too. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Thank you, Michelle, for all you've done to organize the first meeting. and. You're welcome. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry and Amy. We did a little practice session yesterday just to make sure we knew what we were doing before tonight. So <laughs> I appreciate uh, you two sort of having double duty on this program. Richard and Carol, thank you all for tuning in from North Carolina. Great to have you. It was. We hope we'll see you next month. Yeah, we're we're we're, we're really we're, we're glad you're doing it this way because we wouldn't drive to Birmingham, <laughs> <laughs> and we and we probably wouldn't drive to North Carolina to show this presentation either. So it's well, you. Uh, we we certainly hope that you'll be able to before too long. We'd love to have you here. That would be fun. We'd love to have when things get a little more social, undistancing. We'd love to have a field trip there. Yeah, well, uh, we, there, there are lots of good opportunities. Great. We'll look forward to that. All right. Anybody else have any anything? Carolyn, do you have? Uh, no, waving goodbye. <laughs> waving goodbye. All right. Yeah. So, Don't do that in Austin, Carolyn. <laughs> Thank you. Great meeting. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, Thank you Amy. Yeah, thanks right, for buddy. listening, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Adios.